scientists say a new report which shows the Earth's oceans are becoming starved of oxygen. A man-made phenomenon is threatening marine life at the largest dead zone ever recorded in the U.S. The number of so-called dead zones, uh, which are places with little or no oxygen, is growing quickly. Crabs and shrimp are forced to leave or suffocate and die. With changing winds, currents, and seasonal upwelling, the ocean off the Pacific Northwest is in a constant state of transformation. Now, a warming climate is adding new layers of uncertainty to an already turbulent environment. In recent years, incidents of hypoxia, or low oxygen levels, have been on the rise. The resulting dead zones can devastate sea life. People of the Quinault Indian Nation have been living along the Pacific coast for thousands of years. They were among the first to sound the alarm about hypoxia. We're known as salmon people. Nobody knows these resources better than we do. The days of plenty are, are not always so anymore, where there was. Five, six, seven years ago, we had significant coho forecasts and they never came back. They never showed up. In the summer of 2006, I got a call from one of my biologists and a tribal member and they said, you got to get down here to the beaches. And I went down to the beaches with them down there and was just astounded. Over a mile and a half of beach was littered with dead fish of every species. Everything from starry flounders to wolf eels, a cabazon, to of all things anchovies. They were laying everywhere. I've got pictures on my phone of, of that event. We reached out to our elders to see this had been a kind of a known thing in our tribe here. Couldn't find anybody that could remember these kinds of events. We'd see more and more of these hypoxic events following up in 2007, 2009, 2011. We saw recurring events along our beaches out here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty troubling. We're heavily dependent on our fisheries resources here. We have probably seven or 800 fishermen We've been here forever, you know. I mean, it's way before I was born, way before my great-great-grandfather was born. There's probably about 80 fishing grounds here. You know, like my great-great-grandfather, he got one of the prime fishing grounds right in the river based on what he contributed to the tribe back then. And those fishing grounds have been passed down from generation to generation. When a hypoxia event hits like that, it's really it can be pretty devastating to a fish run, you know. Some salmon rely on all the stuff out there that dying from hypoxia event. And they rely on all those different food sources. My livelihood depends on those fish runs. And if that fish run ain't gonna be there in the future, then there goes my livelihood along with 80 other families that rely on this river for their subsistence and existence, you know. So as the wind blows along the coast, it shoves the surface waters offshore. So you replace that with water from below. That's called upwelling. And whenever you pull deeper water, it's lower in oxygen than the surface water. So then the question is, is why does it go hypoxic, which means so low that it affects marine organisms? They start to suffer or die off. The waters that are being sucked in with upwelling actually aren't hypoxic. They're still high enough that the animals should do fine. It's the processes on the shelf that happen next and what goes on there is the plankton blooms die off and they fall to the bottom and the microbes eat that and they draw the oxygen down through a decay process. 
And so that depends on the underwater geography of how the currents interact with the bottom. Climate change affects a couple of things. It's heating the upper layer and it's isolating the lower layers from the atmosphere. So what we're seeing all over the globe is a slow decline in the oxygen of the subsurface waters. Then we bring it up on the shelf and things like changes in the winds that are forced by climate change. And it sort of supercharges the upwelling and the plankton blooms. And that's where we, we add on to the hypoxia. And that's right at the forefront of what we're trying to figure out is where are the zones that are more susceptible to hypoxia and the other ones that are just fine. What we've been trying to do is expand our coverage, our spatial understanding. So we're working with the Quinault Indian Nation to essentially map their waters in their fisheries. We're using the underwater gliders, these robots that can go from the sea surface to the sea floor. And when they surface, they can essentially phone home and send us the information. So these partnerships with the tribes or with the fishing communities lets them use the data, helps us collect more, and helps get the word out. What's in season right now? Uh, so sport prawns in season, and then uh, the coon shrimp is also in season right now. Uh, these uh, begin in May usually, and then ends in August. And how about the crabs? Are they still... Uh, so we get crab like almost every week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then do you get it directly from the fishermen, or is there a... a, a yeah, directly from the fishermen. How much crab do you go through in a, a day or a week? I would say we at least sell like... 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pounds? Oh. Yeah, because we also ship around the U.S. Oh, okay. And uh, restaurants and markets, they come here and like buy, buy it. Wow, 10,000 pounds. At least, yeah. More seafood is sold in Northeast Portland than any other part of Oregon. Live fish and crabs from the state's local fisheries are especially prized here. Businesses and communities like this, far from the coast, can also feel the impact of a changing ocean. I grew up in New York City, and almost every block, there'll be a market that sold fresh seafood, and it was really affordable. My family, that's how we would celebrate, like, let's get some fresh fish, some fresh crab. So it's really important to me that, that that's something that continues on and doesn't become this luxury item that, you know, the 1% gets. I feel like over the past years, we have seen a lower supply of seafood. We think that it's because we have too much competition out there, or it's because of climate change. I guess climate change is such a, uh, a scary topic that people don't want to talk about, which like we usually don't really mention about, but we think about it most of the time. Ultimately, when I do my science, when I try to understand what's happening out there and what we might be able to do about it, it comes back to places like this, because seafood is something that is so important to so many people. Uh, I just want to make sure that there's a future in it, that you know, my kids, uh, other people's kids, they have a chance to have that cookout, be able to feed the family, you know, feed the grandparents a fresh fish. That's so important. Well, I've pretty much fished my whole life. Grew up just inland here, fishing all the time on the local rivers and stuff. Started fishing with a few friends around here about 25 years ago and decided, man, I want an ocean boat. And so I instantly fell in love with the fact that, you know, you could go out anywhere you want. You can have the ocean to yourself. And even the days I didn't catch fish, I didn't care. It was just like so peaceful. You're in the moment, that's what I like. I love to be in the moment. I don't want to spin out and think about too many things. You know, I'm just trying to think, where are they at? What are they going to eat today? Watching the excitement of people catching their fish. And so it just makes it super fun. In Oregon, to keep track of hypoxia, researchers are turning to the people who know ocean conditions best, those who earn their living on the water. Scientist Linus Stoltz leads a project that places sensors in the crab pots of commercial and sport fishers, 
gathering oxygen level readings in real time. This was a new technology. It had never been done before. This is not you know, the first partnership with fishermen to collect oxygen data, but this is the first partnership that is sustained and continuing over multiple years. You know, we partner with fishermen and they take these uh, oxygen sensors and they have a, a companion uh, little computer that sits on their boat and they'll put their uh, oxygen sensors in their crab gear. Anytime that the sensor or, or a pot with a sensor in it lands on deck, it will uh, connect to this computer and send the data to it over Bluetooth. And then once it does that, it logs the location so we know where the data was collected from. And then it packages up and sends it to a, a, a cloud server so we have access to it pretty instantaneously and it hopefully is a growing tool that fishermen can use to fish smarter. Prior to this research, there were really comparatively few locations measuring oxygen for longer periods of time. Dungeness crab is really the backbone of the fisheries and even of coastal communities on the Oregon coast. It is accessible, it's open most of the year. Our communities and our seafood markets are really built around that species. What the research project is really informing is fishermen's day-to-day -day choices and where they put their pots. We're hoping that that kind of information can be really helpful so that they can move their equipment to locations where there are not hypoxia events. As we're seeing these short-term symptoms and planning for the long-term, they're kind of different responses. One is about what do we do this year in response to what we're seeing this year. In the long-term, we're really thinking about can we get a handle on greenhouse gases? Can we get a handle on circulation patterns, wind patterns that are affecting the productivity? An increase in hypoxia is just one of the changes to the world's oceans driven by a transforming climate. Through a combination of research, traditional knowledge, and local expertise, we can learn to adapt at the same time we also pursue broad solutions to the climate crisis. Mother Earth's gonna tell us how successful we're gonna be. We can do the things that we know, science-wise, makes a lot of sense. We need to get some help. First thing is we gotta make people aware of what's going on out there. The ocean affects everything. And so having the interests of the citizens then into the state legislatures, our local communities to push for getting this information and getting it out there. Everyone digging in and understanding more about how a healthy ocean ecosystem works and then committing to the changes that we need to make is the way that every Oregonian can help with this problem. I'm very optimistic. You know, I've gotten to work with a lot of great fishermen through this project. You know, there's certainly a lot of interest in understanding hypoxia, understanding how to respond to it and, and be able to kind of make decisions living with the problem. You know, I don't have kids, but I still want the next generation to have what we've had. What's next year? What's four years going to be like? Like, if there's anything we can do to at least keep it sustainable, and if not, improve. Mother Nature is a great provider. If you take care of Mother Nature, then she'll take care of you, too.